came to light when she was discovered in the basement. 20 years have passed, and yet DNA evidence may just bring a new hope for a breakthrough in this cold case. John Benet Ramsey, that is a name that certainly evokes a lot of imagery. She was so beautiful and innocent, that little girl. Um, I think many of us remember her because she was a pageant star. That was odd for someone who was six years old. But those pictures, wow, did they endure. She was so brutally killed, too. And here we are 20 years later, and the mystery surrounding John Benet's death seems to grow, and it sure does endure as well. It was Christmas night, 1996. John Benet vanished from her beautiful home in Boulder, Colorado. It would be hours later that she was instead found dead in the basement. She'd been strangled. Someone killed John Benet Ramsey, but no one has been brought to justice. The next morning, as the family was planning to fly to Michigan for what they called a second Christmas, John Benet's mother, Patsy Ramsey, found a three-page ransom note, she said. She found it on the steps in her house. Patsy says she ran upstairs. John Benet was not in her bed. And then Patsy made this chilling 911 call. <laughs> So it's been two decades, um, and you might think there have been so many retrospective pieces, everyone's hashing out the case again, but as it turns out, this case is gathering some brand new urgency because the Boulder police are actually planning brand new DNA tests on some very key evidence, and the focus is on the testing of John Monet's underwear and the long johns uh, that she was wearing when they found her body. Bobby Brown is a private investigator on the John Benet case. He joins me live from Denver. Joseph Scott Morgan is a professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University. He joins me from Atlanta. And Dr. William Moroni is a medical examiner, forensic pathologist, and toxicologist. And he joins me live from Madison Heights, Michigan. Gentlemen, thank you all uh, for taking the time to, to talk to me about this because this case, as it turns out 20 years later, is still very much active. Um, what possibly could new DNA tests reveal? Uh, it, it, the science existed back then. Has it refined itself so much more, Bobby Brown, that we could find a new result? Uh, well, uh, obviously, I think that it would depend on uh, the actual evidence that was collected. Uh, there's, and that's the problem that uh, herein lies that uh, the, the actual crime scene uh, was so contaminated and then the evidence had gone from police department to the district attorney's office and back. So there's a, a problem with contamination, there's pro a problem with the, legally with the chain of evidence. So uh, un unfortunately right now, other than what they are releasing, we really don't know uh, what uh, what is available that can n now uh, be tested and if in fact it, that could be of a benefit. I, I want to ask you all, if, if I can, um, specific questions about some <coughs> of the evidence that was so key in this case. Specifically the blanket that she was found wrapped in. Um, Joseph, the, the blanket seems to be critical. It came from her bedroom and it came from the bed that was unmade next to a bed that was made. Why is there such significance to that particular blanket in your opinion? Well, you know, as with every forensic <coughs> case, Ashley, Sorry. the idea here is connectivity. If we look back to what Lacard said over 100 years ago, every contact leaves a trace. 
And this idea is that whose hands did this thing pass through? And this is compelling relative to this idea of uh, putting, putting an individual in the location uh, with this little girl in her room, if she had been in her room, and then the blanket and her being found in the same location together in this kind of sequestered area in this massive house uh, down in the basement uh, where essentially nothing could be heard, nothing could be seen. They didn't find the body for an extended period of time, but yet this blanket is there with the body. So, Dr. Maroney, let me ask you a little bit about the forensic injuries to John Binet. Uh, people know by now that um, she had quite a significant skull fracture. There was actually a hole uh, in her skull. I'm not going to show you yes. that picture, but I do have sort of a, a replica of what the injury looked like. We're showing that to the audience right now. There's been a lot of talk that the hole and the, the formation, the placement of, of where that is, matches up with a, a, a baton-like flashlight that was found in the home. Is there something to this injury that gives you a clue or drives you any closer to any particular suspects? Well, if you look at how that uh, appeared, when I look at a skull, and I, if I show you a skull this way, the fracture, the comminuted fracture, the depression was on the right side. The only way you can have an injury on the right side, if somebody's facing you, is you either have to be left-handed or with the baton or with some linear object, you backhand the skull to create that. And the pattern is that the fracture runs the length. So that shows you that the blunt force trauma was not a round hammerhead. It was a baton-like object like I held up an air freshener can. And the fact that the depression, we call it a comminuted fracture, was down into the brain, is part of the brain trauma below, shows that it was hard enough to crack it and depress it, and that created the bleed that was a subdural hematoma in the brain below where the fracture was. I want to move on to another piece of evidence that um, people may not know about. It's a more obscure part of the case, but it was a pair of boots, Bobby, that were never found. What is the significance of the boots that are mysteriously gone? Well, uh, the significance would be the uh, Patsy uh, reportedly owned a pair of beaver hair boots um, on the night that uh, this all occurred, uh, they, Patsy, uh, John, and John Benet, they had gone to a party, a uh, Christmas party at Fleet White's uh, residence, and uh, Patsy was wearing those beaver hair boots to that party. Uh, obviously, when they went home, at some point, the boots were taken off, whatever happened to them, uh, it remains a question. Uh, however, uh, in under uh, a piece of the duct tape, there was a hair that uh, uh, supposedly was uh, identified by the by an FBI analysis, and that it was a beaver hair. Uh, so, it would be extremely important to know if in fact that those boots, the boots that Patsy owned that had beaver hair, if in fact that uh, hair was from her boots and where are they? And that is extraordinarily fascinating. I know that anybody who does a cross-examination would say if you're wearing a pair of boots like that that night, those hairs are all over the house and could easily have transferred. I could see both sides of that coin, which is part of the problem. Uh, when it comes to this case. Everybody zeroes in on a particular part of evidence and then sometimes to the exclusion of all else. And that's why the three of you are, are very, very valuable tonight. Because when John Binet's body was found, it was pretty obvious that that little six-year-old had been tortured. I took the duct tape off immediately and then tried to untie her hands, but the, the knot was way too tight. I couldn't get it, I couldn't get it loose. And mm -hmm. I couldn't do anything but scream.
there's a pr 20 years later, the John Benet Ramsey murder mystery remains a very active case. In addition to the new DNA testing, the brutality of the crime has always, always been a key piece of this puzzle. Because what it boils down to, investigators have said, as John Benet was killed, she was tortured. The assailant placed a tightly applied ligature around her neck, slowly torturing her. And then when they were through, they pulled that cord very hard and strangled her. Uh, joining me still, Bobby Brown, Joseph Scott Morgan, and Dr. William Maroney. Bobby, if I can just ask you, this notion of the torture, I think many people got that clear as day when they saw that garrote with her hair entangled in it. Was there any other evidence that indicated this was intentional torture or that this was a byproduct of a, of a vicious crime? Well, what you have to ask is that, you know, if, okay, we are looking at a kidnapping, you know, was it an intruder, what, you know, exactly how did this happen? Well, the important thing about, you know, uh, the, the means that she was killed, the garage, uh, you know, as an investigator, it's important for me to look at, you know, all right, uh, at what point did you determine that, you know, if you're kidnapping her, at what point did you decide I'm going to kill her? But not only am I going to kill her, but I'm going to torture her. You know, did that go towards uh, that type of, a, uh, of, of strangulation? It can go with a sex crime. You know, it's, uh, that, it, it's, it, that is common. But this had gone beyond that. Uh, and it was, you know, as opposed to just strangling her, to twist that and twist the garrot and twist it and literally squeeze the life right. out of this wood. Right. It just seems so out of and place. And, and Joseph uh, Scott Morgan, there is this notion as well for those who have not seen the autopsy photographs, and I, I don't recommend it, it is very disturbing. She had two markings from the ligatures, two. And that tells a story about the way she was strangled. What is it? Well, with the markings uh, that are that are there on the neck, what this what this implies is that this garrote, this ligature, was in place and it was readjusted a couple of times. So let's keep in mind, Ashley, that as as was pointed out, this garrote was literally twisted. What's really striking about this case is the fact that this knot that's involved with this garrote that you find in place is very very complex. This is something that would have taken an extended period of time to have, uh, to have facilitated time that would have been spent with the body. And based upon the fact that she's got this deep tissue hemorrhage that's going on and dwelling underlying this ligature, she's alive while this is going on to the point where she was killed. Dr. Moroni pointed out a moment ago that she's got this depressed skull fracture. That's mainly, merely the coup de grace that finally finished her off. But this choking event went on for a while. You couple that along with this extensive, extensive uh, uh, kidnapping note that's there, this person or persons that was involved in this would have had to have been with this body and this child for an extended period of time and have had time with her in a sequestered area. So uh, actually that's a, it's a great point because the timeline of all of this is very mysterious at the same time forensically speaking, maybe not so much. Dr. Maroney, the notion of these three sort of attacks. Uh, there is the strangulation that did not result in death, and as we just heard, uh, Joseph Scott Morgan said the ligature was moved, and then a re-strangulation where she was still alive because there is this blood pooling, as I understand it, and then this third attack, this, this assault uh, with some kind of a weapon, uh, the head um, injury that she sustained. Help me understand when this child died in that timeline of injuries. Well. The previous gentleman hit exactly on what happened in the strangulation. I believe the first strangulation was an upward strangulation. That's why the mark is so low. And the second strangulation that was an adjustment is from an upward, which would have been a taller person, an adult, then pulling the uh, deceased backwards. The second strangulation is more midline where you have thinner muscles 
and a more fatal effect. And the furrow in the neck created by the garrot shows the vitality of the subject at the time of the assault. So she was awake and it was uh, very terrible. But um, in a timeline, I would say that if she was being strangled, we may have an option that the head wound was first because of the accumulated blood. And if that's true, the head wound could have been an accident and not part of the assault. Whereas it's impossible to have an accidental strangulation. I'd like to inject that to say that if the head wound was um, after the strangulation, it might have much less blood and the hematoma may not have accumulated. Whereas if it was before, that's how we collected so much damage up there. But a two-stage strangulation, an upward and then a backward. It's, it's all so mystifying and fascinating at the same time. And um, I mean, Lord knows that we are getting better and better as crime fighters, forensically speaking, that uh, that smoking gun gets smaller and smaller. So it'll be critical to see what these new DNA tests uh, can tell us. Thank you so much, all three of you, for your insight. And I dare say you'll probably be invited back when we get the results of whatever is being tested. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you Good night. for having me. Thank you, Ash. A mysterious death as a 